Let's pray. Lord, we join the chorus proclaiming that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And we are so thankful for the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ that anyone who would come to you by repentance and faith will be received into the kingdom of God and have everlasting hope. And so, Lord, within that context, we turn now to your word. And we pray that you would strengthen us with your hope, that you would give us a faith that is deeper and stronger And Lord, that you would help us to focus on you, to run with perseverance the race marked out for us. And Lord, to recognize that because you are faithful, by your spirit, we can be faithful too. So help us, Lord. Teach us, mold us, make us, transform us to be more like Jesus. For it's in his precious and holy name that we pray. Amen. Well, I have to tell you that this text I chose specifically for Father's Day, but it doesn't really have anything to do with being a dad. But when we were on our trip to the Holy Land, this was the site that I think made me feel the most like a dad. And again, it really didn't have much to do with the story other than the fact that I knew I was going to get to tell this story in this place and that pretty much nobody would know this was coming. And so this is one of those stories where When we were coming from Masada, we were on our way to Qumran, we were going to the Dead Sea that afternoon, and we were going to stop at this little place uh, called En Gedi, or Ein Gedi, and uh, God was going to speak to our hearts there, and He did. So I want to invite you to open your Bible with me to 1 Samuel chapter 24. 1 Samuel chapter 24, we're going to look at verses 1 through 22, which is the whole chapter. Uh, If you're in the room, that's uh, page 246 in the Red Pew Bible in front of you. But we're going to look at the entire chapter. But I have to tell you that when you come to En Gedi, you have to have gone into the Judean wilderness. And so it's about an hour drive south of Jerusalem. So you come down from Jerusalem, and, and the landscape changes remarkably. I mean, you're coming from Jerusalem, and you're going down to the Dead Sea, which is the lowest point on planet Earth. So you're, you're descending, but you are also descending from pretty rich vegetation to the Judean wilderness. And I have to tell you, the experience of being in the Judean wilderness will give you more compassion for those who had to wander for 40 years in the desert. Because I want to tell you, walking around in the Judean wilderness gets old pretty quick. I mean, it, it, it gets warm pretty quick. I, have you ever been to the desert? I had never been to a true desert, and so coming from Jerusalem where it was a little chilly that morning and going down into the Judean wilderness was a stark change. So we went first to Masada, and this is King Herod's desert fortress. I mean, it's unbelievable. King Herod built so many amazing things. But you go up to the top of this mountaintop, and and you do it by cable car, praise the Lord, unless your name is Gerald Brown, who's a member of our church, who's walked up to the top of Masada several times, bless his heart. But you ride up a cable car, and you're there among among these ruins, this archaeological site, but you're looking out and it is the most amazing thing you've ever seen. But there's a lot of brown. There's a lot of dirt and a lot of, it's not even like sand like we would classify sand. It's just, it's just, and it's vast and it stretches out. And then you look and there's the Dead Sea and the Dead Sea's big and it's blue against this brown and it's gorgeous. And I cannot imagine how many times over Thousands of years, people have been so disappointed when they got to the Dead Sea because it looks like this grand oasis, but it's not. The Dead Sea has a salt level that is 10 times higher than the ocean. You can't drink Dead Sea water, otherwise you will become like the name very quickly. In fact, when you go into the Dead Sea, they have this lookout of lifeguards with a huge speaker system because they will kick you out of the Dead Sea. You are not allowed to float on your belly in the Dead Sea because you might ingest some water. And if you do ingest some water, they have to render medical treatment immediately because the salt content and the mineral content is so high. Now, that's great for your skin, and the mud's great for your skin. So we had people from our trip who were rubbing mud all over themselves. It was wonderful, but you couldn't drink the water. So you're out in the desert, and here's this huge sea stretching 
out before you and you can't drink any of it. So what do you have to do? Well, you gotta find water. Water is so important. And at En Gedi, or Ein Gedi, both pronunciations are correct, it was a spring, one of very few springs that are around the Dead Sea. And so this spring at Ein Gedi had become a necessary stop for travelers through this region literally for thousands of years. Not just people, animals too. I mean, this was a gathering spot, a true oasis. Incidentally, you also understand why Jericho is the oldest populated city in the world. Because there's green there, there's water there. And so in the wilderness, truly, you have these oases where people and animals and every living thing gathers to be nourished, to be hydrated. You got to have it. Well, David knew all about En Gedi. David was very familiar with this land, and there was an occasion for David to need a place to hide. King Saul was the first king over Israel, and David had been anointed to be the next king over Israel, but Saul didn't know it. Saul didn't even know that the kingdom had been taken from him. Yes, Samuel had told him that would be the case, but but it hadn't happened yet. And so have you ever received bad news, but then it, it just didn't happen, so you kind of forgot about it? Well... Saul kind of forgot about it, and David was raised up. He killed a giant, and then he became a great hero in war, such that the maidens would come out and say, Saul has killed his thousands, but David, his tens of thousands. And all of a sudden, King Saul got jealous. He got jealous of David, who was getting more positive press than he was. And so his anger was stirred against David, and he began to pursue David to try to kill David. Well, David and his men were hiding, and they found that the caves at En Gedi were a great place to hide. They could hide there for refuge, and they could hide there for hydration, and they could hide there and be sustained while Saul and his thousands of men were trying to come capture and kill David, all because Saul was jealous. The Bible tells us and hints that some of David's psalms were probably written in the caves at En Gedi. They're at least written in caves in the Judean wilderness. Psalm 57 and Psalm 63 and Psalm 142. And when you go and and read those psalms within the context of that setting, what changes everything? For example, Psalm 63, 1 starts out by saying this, O God, you are my God. Earnestly I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh faints for you as in a dry and weary land where there is no water. Let me tell you something. When you're actually standing in that dry and weary land and you forgot your chapstick and your lips are dried out and you're drinking water and it's not making that much of a difference, and your mouth gets really dry because the climate is so arid, all of a sudden you get what David was talking about in a whole new way. Well, something happened in the caves at En Gedi, something significant. David had an opportunity to overcome Saul once and for all, and he was tempted. He was tempted to do it because then he wouldn't have to flee anymore. Then he wouldn't have to hide and hope that his life would be spared anymore. But David knew that God had forbidden him from doing the thing that he was tempted to do. And so I wanna give you this theme today, and we're gonna learn this from David. If you're taking notes, the theme is, do the right thing in God's eyes. Do the right thing in God's eyes. Doesn't that sound like fatherly advice? Not too complicated. Just here's the, here's, the, here's the thing. Do the right thing in God's eyes. 1 Samuel chapter 24, we're going to start out by looking at the first seven verses. And God tells us this. When Saul returned from following the Philistines, he was told, Behold, David is in the wilderness of En Gedi. Then Saul took 3,000 chosen men out of all Israel and went to seek David and his men in front of the wild goat's rocks. And he came to the sheepfolds by the way where there was a cave, and Saul went in to relieve himself. Now David and his men were sitting in the innermost parts of the cave. 
And when the men of David said to him, here is the day of which the Lord said to you, behold, I will give your enemy into your hand and you shall do to him as it, as, as it shall seem good to you. Then David arose and stealthily cut off a corner of Saul's robe. And afterward, David's heart struck him because he had cut off a corner of Saul's robe. He said to his men, the Lord forbid that I should do this thing to my Lord, the Lord's anointed, to put out my hand against him, seeing he is the Lord's anointed. So David persuaded his men with these words and did not permit them to attack Saul. And Saul rose up and left the cave and went on his way. Our first point today is this, do the right thing in God's eyes, even if it doesn't make sense. Now, I'm not going to expound too much on the picture that's being painted in the scriptures here, but what's in your mind is what's happening. In other words, David had been invited by the opportunity to take his sword and play t-ball. That's how easy this would have been. He could have taken Saul's head off and been done with the whole thing. But David also knew that Saul was the Lord's anointed. In 1 Samuel chapter 10, verse 1, we learn that Samuel took a flask of oil and poured it on Saul's head and kissed him and said, has not the Lord anointed you to be prince over his people Israel? And you shall reign over the people of the Lord and you will save them from the hand of their surrounding enemies. And this shall be the sign to you that the Lord has anointed you to be prince over his heritage. So Saul was the Lord's anointed. And yes, David was too, but Saul was the one currently serving the Lord in the place of king. And David further knew that in Exodus chapter 22, verse 28, God had said, you shall not revile God nor curse a ruler of your people. So in that moment, it made perfect sense to all of David's men that he should go to Saul and he should play the world's greatest game of t-ball the world has ever seen. Just one swing and that's it. Apparently Saul was so engrossed in what he had going on, he wasn't paying attention. David was able to come up and cut the corner off of Saul's robe. It all could have been over, could have been done. No longer would David have had to have fled no longer would David have had to have feared for his life. It could have been over. And it looked like, and even according to his friends, it seemed like God had delivered Saul into David's hand. But David knew that that was not God's will. Why was it not God's will? Because God had said, don't stretch out your hand against a ruler of your people. Don't touch the Lord's anointed. And so even after he cut off the corner of Saul's robe, David's heart struck him because he felt bad about it. I shouldn't even done that. Sometimes the right thing doesn't make sense. Sometimes the entire culture will tell you that the right thing is the wrong thing. Sometimes 51% of the electorate will vote that the right thing is the wrong thing and the wrong thing is the right thing. And the question that you and I have to ask is this, among the din of cultural pressure, and even with friends who love us saying, look, this just makes sense. This is clearly from God. You and I have a choice to make. Will we do the right thing in our eyes? Will we do the right thing in the world's eyes? Or will we do the right thing in God's eyes? I would imagine there was not a single man who had given his life to protecting David, to hiding with David, to fleeing with David, to being with David, who wasn't grumbling just a little bit under his breath in this moment. Because not only could everything have been over for David, everything could have been over for them. They, they wouldn't have to hide in a cave anymore. They could go to Hebron, they could go to Jerusalem, they could, they could just live their lives. And I can only imagine that they're grumbling under their voice. Seriously, seriously, David, seriously, you're not just gonna take care of this? Look, the circumstances tell us that God has opened this door for you. And seriously, but God said, uh, David said, no, I don't care what the circumstances tell me, God said this. So I'm gonna do the right thing in God's eyes, even when it doesn't make sense to you 
And even when it doesn't really make sense to me, if you want to know the truth. Twice in the Proverbs, in Proverbs 14, 12, and in Proverbs 16, 25, it says, there's a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way to death. Just because it seems right doesn't mean it is right. That's what happened in the Garden of Eden. Satan was good. He tempted Eve. At least Eve had to be tempted by a talking serpent. Adam, who had received the prohibition from God himself, was too dumb to say, no, I'm not eating any of that. But what happened? The serpent tempted, and Eve looked at the fruit, and what did she see? This is Genesis chapter 3, verse 6. She saw three things, that it was good for food, that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was desired to make one wise. Those are all good things. God designed her to need food. This tree is good for food. God designed her to appreciate beauty. It was a delight to the eyes. God designed her to seek wisdom. If you don't believe me, go read the first seven chapters of Proverbs. It's very important. So those are all three good things. And so Eve started doing the math in her head. And it made sense. I know God said, but. And what's so interesting is that's the same pattern that the enemy has used ever since the Garden of Eden. He uses it still today. I know God said, but this just makes sense. Well, God's not asking us to live our lives according to what makes sense to us in the moment. Like this suit I'm wearing today. There's a meme going around right now, and it's a picture of Pee Wee Herman. How many of you are ancient enough to remember Pee Wee Herman? Right? Ha <laughs> ha! You know? Y'all grew up watching it? And the meme says, y'all grew up making fun of Pee Wee Herman's suit, and now this is what your son is wearing to go to prom. And now these pants are so tight on my legs. Who wears pants like this? But that's what's in style, right? It's what's in style. Don't, don't laugh too much. Some of y'all wore bell bottoms. Some of y'all had more polyester on you. You were so flammable, you didn't even know it. But you looked good in the moment. Isn't it interesting? You can look back at pictures of you from just a few minutes ago and realize, what was I thinking? But we've all agreed that this is what is right in the moment. And you know what? Give it a couple years, it won't be right anymore. When my grandfather passed away, he had a closet full of ties. He worked for the Daily News. He wore a tie to work every single day. Closet full of ties. In my line of work, I wear a lot of ties. But when my grandfather passed away, all those ties had paisleys on them. I said, well, those will never come back in style again. Do you know that three quarters of the ties in my closet have paisleys on them now? But I got rid of all the ones that did. See, things can make sense for a second. God is eternal. See the difference? So, first point, do the right thing in God's eyes even when it doesn't make sense. Look with me at the next paragraph, beginning with verse 8. Afterward, David also arose and went out of the cave and called after Saul, My Lord the King! And when Saul looked behind him, David bowed with his face to the earth and paid homage. And David said to Saul, why do you listen to the words of men who say, behold, David seeks your harm? Behold, this day your eyes have seen how the Lord gave you today into my hand in the cave. And some told me to kill you, but I spared you. I said, I will not put out my hand against the Lord, for he is the Lord's anointed. See my father, see the corner of your robe in my hand. For by the fact that I cut off the corner of your robe and did not kill you, you may know and see that there is no wrong or treason in my hands. I have not sinned against you, though you hunt my life to take it. May the Lord judge between me and you. May the Lord avenge me against you, but my hand shall not be against you. As the proverb of the ancients says, out of the wicked comes wickedness, but my hand shall not be against you. After whom has the king of Israel come out? After whom do you pursue? After a dead dog, after a flea. May the Lord therefore be judge and give sentence between me and you and see to it and plead my cause and deliver me from your hand. Our second point. Do the right thing in God's eyes and trust God 
to be the judge. Do the right thing in God's eyes and trust God to be the judge. What does David say? 1 Samuel 24, verse 15, the last verse I just read. It's also at the bottom of your notes, incidentally. May the Lord therefore be judge and give sentence between me and you and see to it and plead my cause and deliver me from your hand. Do the right thing in God's eyes and trust God to be the judge. You know, sometimes it seems like the wicked prosper, doesn't it? Sometimes it seems like those who are absolutely devoted to not doing it God's way seem to be prospering. They have all the money. They have all the fame. They have all the success. It seems like we're the dumb ones, right? We're committed to doing it God's way against the tide of cultural pressure, but it seems like everybody who's not committed to doing it God's way or is committed to doing it against God's way seems to be enjoying all of the wonderful things. Well, the Bible actually speaks to that. There's two Psalms that I want you to write these down, and it's easy to remember. It's Psalm 37 and Psalm 73. Both of those. Psalm 37 is a Psalm of David, and I'll read you a portion of it. He says, fret not yourself because of evildoers. Be not envious of wrongdoers, for they will soon fade like the grass and wither like the green herb. Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and befriend faithfulness. Delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust in him and he will act. He will bring forth your righteousness as the light and your justice as the noonday. Be still before the Lord and wait patiently for him. Fret not yourself over the one who prospers in his way, over the man who carries out evil devices. Refrain from anger and forsake wrath. Fret not yourself, it tends only to evil. For the evildoers shall be cut off, but those who wait for the Lord shall inherit the land. In just a little while, the wicked will be no more. Though you look carefully at his place, he will not be there. But the meek shall inherit the land and delight themselves in the abundant peace. What's David saying? Play the long game. Play the long game. It's easy to have success for a moment. Play the long game. Psalm 73, this is Asaph. Read you a portion of that. He says, truly God is good to Israel, to those who are pure in heart. But as for me, my feet had almost stumbled. My steps had nearly slipped. For I was envious of the arrogant when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. For they have no pangs until death. Their bodies are fat and sleek. They are not in trouble as others are. They are not stricken like the rest of mankind. Therefore, pride is their necklace. Violence covers them as a garment. Their eyes swell out through fatness. Their hearts overflow with follies. They scoff and speak with malice. Loftily, they threaten oppression. They set their mouths against the heavens and their tongue struts through the earth. Therefore, his people turn back to them and find no fault in them. And they say, how can God know? Is there knowledge in the Most High? Behold, these are the wicked, always at ease. They increase in riches. All in vain have I kept my heart clean and washed my hands in innocence. For all the day long I've been stricken and rebuked every morning. If I had said I will speak thus, I would have betrayed the generation of your children. But when I thought how to understand this, it seemed to me a wearisome task until I went into the sanctuary of God Then I discerned their end. Truly, you set them in slippery places. You make them fall to ruin. How they are destroyed in a moment, swept away utterly by terrors. Like a dream when one awakes, O Lord, when you rouse yourself, you despise them as phantoms. What is Asaph saying here? He's saying it looks good for a minute. But it's not going to end well. Play the long game. Make the decisions now that will work out better 10,000 years from now. We have that choice. I can either do what's right in this moment, recognizing that what is right in this moment will likely change pretty quickly. The tides of culture, they shift like shifting sands, right? The winds blow in different directions, and and in one moment something's wonderful, and the next moment something's anathema. 
So you can play the short game and keep trying to change, or you can trust the one who is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore and do what's right in his eyes and let him be the judge in the end because incidentally, he is and he will be. And every one of us will give an account, not to the culture, but to him. I do what's right in his eyes. Verse 16, as soon as David had finished speaking these words to Saul, Saul said, is this your voice, my son, David? And Saul lifted up his voice and wept. He said to David, you are more righteous than I, for you have repaid me good, whereas I have repaid you evil. And you have declared this day how you have dealt well with me and that you did not kill me when the Lord put me into your hands. For if a man finds his enemy, will he let him go away safe? So may the Lord reward you with good for what you have done to me this day. And now behold, I know that you shall surely be king and that the kingdom of Israel shall be established in your hand. Swear to me, therefore, by the Lord, that you will not cut off my offspring after me and that you will not destroy my name out of my father's house. And David swore this to Saul. Then Saul went home, but David and his men went up to the stronghold. Last point. Do the right thing in God's eyes and leave the outcome to him. Do the right thing in God's eyes and leave the outcome to him. King Saul, having lost the protection of God, having had the the spirit of God removed from him, died a pitiful death. He really did. You can read about it in 1 Samuel chapter 31. He died a pitiful death. The Philistines had come against him and he knew he was beaten and he didn't want to say that I I got beat so he fell on his own sword. And then he asked an Amalekite to finish the job. What about David? Well, you can read the account in 2 Samuel chapter 5 that David was anointed king over Judah and over Israel. He reigned from Hebron, then he reigned 33 years from Jerusalem. If you go with us to the Holy Land, you're going to go to the city of David, and you're going to look at David's palace, at least the foundational ruins of David's palace. And you're going to look at the city that David established, and you're going to see. David's name still stands. There's a big major road in Jerusalem. It's called King David Street. We're staying pretty close to it. His name still stands. God established his throne forever. Jesus Christ himself is of the line of David. And Jesus reigns forevermore such that one day every knee will bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue confess exactly what our choir sang to us in the anthem today. Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So... We have a decision. Temptations are going to come. Have you all found that? They're going to come. Will we do what is right in our eyes? Will we do what is right in the cultural eyes of the moment? Or will we do what is right in the one who said, I am the same yesterday, today, and forever? Will we play the short game? so that we enjoy right this second with a fleeting happiness? Or will we play the long game, trusting that 10,000 years from now, if we do what's right in God's eyes, it'll still be working out? Would you pray with me?